and, and I do wish you all a Happy New Year. Um, first thing I'd like to do is introduce myself and the members of the Squirrel Hill Historical Society Executive Board. I'm Helen Wilson, one of the two vice, vice, right, vice principals, I'm thinking schools, um, um, vice presidents, and our other vice president is Betty Connolly, right there. Our president, Michael Ehrman, couldn't be here today. Uh, he's traveling, so, um, but he told me to give you all his regards. Um, we have Audrey Glickman, who is working the video um, camera. And the reason she's doing that is because all of our programs are online at our website, which is squirrelhillhistory.org. Um, so you can go to the website, and if you've missed a program or if you're interested in one of our topics, you can view it online through the website. Wayne Bossinger, way in the back, is a consummate researcher. And he's found out so much about Squirrel Hill that we didn't know. Um, um, it's just amazing, and we thank you. <laughs> so, uh, let's see. Um, uh, Dr. Jean Binstock is usually here, but I don't see her tonight. No, okay. Um, uh, Ralph Lund, Toby Chapman, Jim Hammond, and Evelyn Young. And we're all volunteers. We serve um, without um, any remuneration. But uh, all volunteer organization. But um, let's see. But uh, the Squirrel Hill Historical Society is a little like a thoroughbred horse because um, they all have their birthdays in January, right? Well, our membership year runs from January to December, and no matter when you join our organization, um, since we start in January. Uh, the earlier you join, the more you will get out of the membership. So, uh, on, your t on your seats are membership forms, and also um, a sheet that tells you what our upcoming programs are. So, you're probably thinking, these programs are free. Why do I need to be a become a member? Well, there's two reasons. First of all, our members get monthly newsletters. Um, there's a few in the back, the old, older ones, if you want to take a look at them. But they're eight-page newsletters, and if you notice, if you look at our talks, the talks, um, many of them don't pertain specifically to Squirrel Hill. They have to do with um, other parts of Pittsburgh or, um, or cultural organizations. But the Squirrel Hill, our, our newsletter deals specifically with Squirrel Hill research. We members um, of the board, we don't meet and discuss research, but we write articles and we put them in our newsletter. So, and also we have contributors. I'm looking to see, um, there's several people who have already contributed articles. Anybody can, and they're very interesting things like a haunted house in Squirrel Hill and a, an anti-aircraft battery and the circus that came, Barnum and Bailey came to Browns Hill Road. So these are all very interesting little articles that tell you, give you a bigger picture about Squirrel Hill. So it um, comes out monthly. It's an eight-page uh, eight page newsletter that comes out every month. And this gets sent to you either by email or by um, post office mail, whichever you prefer. So that's one of the perks. The other thing is, since we are an all-volunteer organization, all the money that we generate goes towards things like um, rent and insurance and any other expenses we may incur. So um, your membership really helps because that's about our only source of income besides donations. So feel free to renew or to, to, to join. And if not, please still keep coming to our meetings because um, this is our bread and butter. We love having these meetings every month, and um, looking forward to. Oh, Charlie! <laughs> We're looking forward to. You just wanted to get my attention, right? <laughs> um, um, speaking of writers, um, Charlie, <laughs> excellent writer for Shady Avenue Magazine. So, um, so let me see. I have a cheat sheet um, on the back table. Um, manned by two volunteers, is um, inf uh, it has information about the Squirrel Hill Historical Society and our books for sale. So we have two books, one written in 2005 and one released in 2017. 
Um, so they're back there. Everything's $20. If you were here for last month's talk, um, Todd Wilson on bridges. We did bring I, I did bring calendars and the books that the books that he had written. So if you're interested, some people asked me to bring some this week, this this month. So they're back there if you're interested. Um, and speaking of books, and this was just serendipity, but this book was put out by Pittsburgh History and Landmarks. It's about. Um, Colfax students going on a walking tour of Squirrel Hill last year, fourth grade students, because History and Landmarks feels that getting young people involved in getting to know their neighborhood, looking at the architecture, looking at architect ar architectural features, will help them become interested in historical preservation when they get older. So they invest a lot of their resources in working with children in the Pittsburgh Public Schools and other schools. So um, this is the book that was put out after the Colfax walking tour of downtown Squirrel Hill. And you can look at them if you would like your own copy, contact History and Landmarks and they will send you a copy. If you're thinking, well, I don't, I don't have anything to do with Colfax, um, in the back, and I wish I could hold this up, this is full of children's writings and stories and illustrations about their experiences in walking around the neighborhood. But in the back are worksheets that you can use with your children or grandchildren in any neighborhood about what you want, what you can look at, what you can interview people about. So the worksheets can be used in any neighborhood. So um, again, contact Pittsburgh History and Landmarks if you would like a copy of the book. And there's several back there to look at. And, oh, last thing um, is, I usually, we usually say this at the very end of our talks, but I will tell you now that if you haven't come to our talks before, um, what we do, we, we have to put the chairs out before you come, and in order for us to easily put the chairs back, we just ask if you would carry your chair and just kind of stack it up against the wall, and we'll have our volunteers take care of putting them up on the racks again. Okay, so, um, Squirrel Hills Public Schools. Before I retired and became vice president of the Squirrel Hill Historical Society, I was a Pittsburgh Public Schools teacher. I taught art in elementary school and middle school. Linden was the closest school that I taught in, but my two sons went to Minadeo and Alderdice, so we have plenty of experience between us in the Pittsburgh, with the Pittsburgh Public Schools in this area. Um, I'm going to start by asking, how many of you went to a Pittsburgh Public School in, in Squirrel Hill? And a Pittsburgh Public School anywhere else? Okay, so um, it's about half. And as I look at the people who raised their hands, the thing about the public, public schools is that your experience and your memories uh, um, are dependent on when you went to school, which school you went to, which teacher you had, and even who your friends were. This would all color your experiences. And we could spend hours re reminiscing about the experiences that you had and your stories. So I'm not going to do that tonight. But what I'm going to ask you, if you want to write down a story or a bit of a history about a school, and you can send it to me either via email through the Squirrel Hill Historical Society or um, at our post office address, and I'll publish it in the newsletter. More people will, will be able to see it and it will be archived. So um, again, instead of telling me your stories um, now, write them down and then send them to me. Okay, so, up here, <coughs> Squirrel Hills Public Schools. And this will work. I did plug it in. Ow. There we go. Okay. 
and I'm looking because the color's off, and I apologize. This isn't what it looks like on the screen. But anyway, uh, setting the stage for public education in Pennsylvania in general. Uh, the area that we are sitting in right now um, was starting to become, become, be settled in the 1760s. Children were educated at home or maybe at Sunday schools. Um, this area was complete wilderness. It had um, ancient trees. Um, if there was any farmland, it had to be cleared by these settlers with their um, axes. Um, it was a harsh environment. Um, this is the Neal Log House in Shenley Park, built around 1769, to give you an idea of what houses looked like back then. They were few and far between, so there was no way a public school could have been established at that time. However, these people were coming from Europe, mostly, and they were coming from the East Coast, which was um, full of cities. And when they came to the wilderness, they did not want to, and in the words of some of the writers, descend into savagery. Meaning, they didn't want to lose learning. They didn't want to lose their knowledge of reading and writing and arithmetic and history and culture. So it was very important to them, um, many of them, to continue somehow to teach their, their, their children to, um, to read and write and do math. Um, Pittsburgh, in the early days, had about 21 newspapers. So um, it was very important to keep this learning going, however it could be done. So um, meanwhile, recognizing the value, value of education, the Pennsylvania Constitution of 1790, that's like almost like there's the time of the uh, Revolutionary War, provided that the legislature might establish schools throughout the state for the gratuitous teaching of the poor. Uh, yeah, yeah, that was kind of fighting words there. During the next 40 years, laws were passed in efforts to create public schools, but these were met with a lot of resistance, mainly over the oppressive cost to taxpayers of providing free education to the poor. This sounds, there's a bit of a resonance today. Uh, real progress was finally made with the passage of the Free Public School Act of 1834. It ordered school districts not only to establish free schools, but also to establish them in townships outside city limits. Whoa. Revolutionary. Squirrel Hill was outside of Pittsburgh's city limits at the time. It was part of uh, Peebles and Liberty Townships until they were annexed by Pittsburgh in 1868. And um, I don't know if you can see this dotted line, but that's, a, that's where Squirrel Hill is. Those are the borders of Squirrel Hill. So you can see it's within Liberty and Peebles um, townships outside of Pittsburgh. The border was Junction Hollow. That's the valley between Oakland and Squirrel Hill. So if you go to Carnegie Museum, you're in Oakland. Carnegie Mellon University <coughs> is across that deep ravine, and that's Squirrel Hill. That was the border, and of course, down in the valley was Boundary Street. The reason it has that name is because it was the boundary between Pittsburgh and the rest of the townships. Uh, when these municipalities were annexed by Pittsburgh, uh, Pittsburgh had the ward system, so these townships were divided into wards. And Squirrel Hill became the 22nd <coughs> ward, and became the 14th ward around 1911. And uh, what amazes me is that this, this ward, the shape of this ward, 14th ward, has never changed. It's always been that shape from the beginning. It never varied in its um, contours. In the 1980s, the 14th, not till the 1980s, was the 14th Ward subdivided into neighborhoods. So that's when we get Point Breeze North, Point Breeze, Regent Square, Swiss Elm Park, Squirrel Hill South, Squirrel Hill North, and on my computer that is bright yellow. <laughs> so um, go figure. Um, anyway, the Pittsburgh public school system in 1868 
So that is right when the townships were annexed. The 22nd, now 14th Ward, was named the Colfax School District. After 1911, it was, it was the Colfax Sub-District because that's when, in 1911, that's when the Board of Education, the Central Board of, the, Board of Education, was um, founded. That's when all the schools were consolidated under the Pittsburgh Board of Public Education was the official name, and um, um, everything else became a sub-district. But they, can, they kept their names. So who was Colfax? <coughs> sure, you know, I always have trouble with this name. Anybody want to tell me? Skyler. Skyler? Okay, thank you. I've heard several variations, but that one sounds good. Anyway, uh, Sky, 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 <laughs> Colfax <laughs> was vice president under Ulysses S. Grant. And he was elected in 1869. He had nothing to do with Squirrel Hill, uh, except that the school board in Squirrel Hill admired him because when he was Speaker of the House, he cast the final vote in favor of the 13th Amendment, which abolished slavery in the United States. And he was one of the founders of the Republican Party, which you know was founded in Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. Colfax School District had two schools in 1868, and neither of those schools, those dots, correspond to a school that's in place today. So where were these? The first school. Around 1840, a man named Fleming, I couldn't find his first name, built a small brick school between Shady and Murray Avenues. This map is very interesting because um, you can see the school right here. There it is. But look at Forward Avenue. It went up this way. It didn't go straight. Here you can see this dotted line means they were planning to straighten it out. But this creek was in the way. So under Forward Avenue today, this creek is culverted somewhere down below. So there it is. And here is an ice pond. In the old days, you had an ice pond and you let it freeze in winter, cut it up, put it in an ice house and sold it to be put in your ice box. So they'd put it in their um, horse-drawn wagons and take the ice to different houses and put the ice in the ice boxes. So this ice pond right here, um, sort of right where the parking lot to the uh, athletic field of Alder Alderdice is today. So that was the ice pond. Here's Alderdice. And this old school was on what's now Eldridge <coughs> Street. But if you look at the alignment, it looks like this bottom part of Eldridge was the old alignment of Forward Avenue. Um, which is, that happens a lot in Squirrel Hill. As the roads were put on the hills, but as modern technology came and construction equipment came about and they started to level these roads and straighten them and culvert all those creeks and they, um, they would change road alignments. And believe it or not, we have a picture of that school. There it is, schools of Colfax sub-district improve with age. And this probably isn't the, what the original, original building looks like. It might have been um, like maybe siding added or um, might have had an extension added. But this is a picture from the Post-Gazette of 1907 with an article about these early schools. This is the one that was on Eldridge Street. And today, it is this apartment house. And in Squirrel Hill, anytime you have a um, area in front of a building like that, that, could, that means it was some kind of a um, business, like a car dealership or a school or something. You know, that indicates that something was there before that. Now, the other early school in the 22nd Ward was Sterrett School, which was built in 1872, possibly earlier. Um, this is the map from 1868, but that's, that dot there does not match up with the present-day Sterrett. So here's Sterrett in 1882, and it says sub-district because in 1877, the Sterrett sub-district was formed out of a part of the Colfax district. 
um, population was increasing. So the sub the sub districts were divided into sub districts. So you have Colfax schools down here and the Sterrett here. Um, but look where it is. And then on a 1910 map, it has moved from here over to there. A new Sterrett school was built down the street be sometime before 1903. I couldn't find the exact date. Um, so where that is today, there's Sterrett. Here is the Frick Art and Historical S Center, the, ar the art museum. And there is where the original Sterrett school was. And that does match up with that dot on the map. So the five Colfax schools. By the early 1900s, the Colfax district had five schools numbered Colfax number one, number two, number three, number four, and number five. Well, you can imagine, I'm sending a package to a Colfax school. If you don't have that number, you're going to have problems. So that led to a lot of confusion. Um, around 1894, somewhere around there, each school was given a different name. And the names were based on either the streets or the, um, or the neighborhood. So, Colfax number one, Phillips and William Pitt Boulevard. Where is that? Yeah, Beechwood Boulevard, that's right. Um, for about 10 years, the Daughters of the American Revolution wanted to name major streets in Pittsburgh after heroes. And they got Beachwood Boulevard renamed as William Pitt Boulevard. Squirrel Hill did not like that. And they fought very hard to get that name back. And they partially succeeded because the part of Beachwood Boulevard in Squirrel Hill did revert to its original name. But the part of Beachwood Boulevard that was Washington Boulevard is still Washington Boulevard. So that was Beachwood Boulevard as well. But it kept its Washington Boulevard name. So that's the Colfax that is still Colfax. Okay, Colfax number two. Well, what happened to Colfax number two? Well, I'll tell you later. Uh, Colfax number three, uh, Forward and Artisan, um, was the Forward Avenue School. Now that sounds pretty simple, but Forward Avenue, uh, Saline Street and Pocusset, they juggled that name, so the school ended up on Saline Street, even though it was on Forward Avenue. Uh, same street, depends on which map you're looking at. Colfax number four, Whipple and Commercial, so that was changed to Swiss Elm because it's in Swiss Elm Park. Colfax number five, Solway and Whiteman. That became Thomas Whiteman School. So here's Colfax school number one. It's originally a wooden schoolhouse, um, built in 1868 and uh, remodeled in 1872. And I'm sorry, I don't usually read captions, but I can't resist reading this one. Beachwood Boulevard was just a farm road. Teachers used the electric trolley line that came on Murray Avenue. There was a dangerous marshy spot at the intersection of Phillips and Shady Avenues where quicksand had taken some lives. <laughs> the teachers also avoided going by way of Munhall, Hobart, or Beacon, then Paths. For the area contained abandoned coal mines and was inhabited by unsavory characters. <laughs> this is a different Squirrel Hill from what we know. <laughs> so anyway, um, Colfax School number one is still Colfax School. It was built in 1911. The architect was <coughs> Edward Stoltz, and the style is ja Jacobean Revival. That was deemed appropriate for um, um, serious learning. Um, it wasn't like the frilly Victorian architecture. Um, this was, you knew by looking at this, that this was a place where you went for educational purposes. Um, it says Colfax School number one right on the facade. There it is. <laughs> Celebrated its 100th anniversary in 2011. Had a big celebration. Did anybody go? You yeah. did. I know you did. Uh, several of you. So um, I heard, I didn't get there, but I heard that you couldn't even get in because so many people had attended. So um, today, Pittsburgh Colfax is K-8, to um, has 862 students, and ranks above Pennsylvania's average in math and reading proficiency. And I do want to say one thing about, 
you see the Pittsburgh schools now say, they have the word Pittsburgh in front of them, Pittsburgh, Colfax, Pittsburgh, Menadeo, uh, et cetera. And that's because um, in directories, that groups them all together. So that if you're going to look up schools, if you come to the Pittsburgh schools, they're all in one place instead of all over the map. So that's the reason they did that. Um, here's Colfax number two. It was erected in 1885 on Beechwood Boulevard at Saline Street. So this is um, down towards Browns Hill Road. Um, that's that dangerous part of Saline that mm -hmm. you take your life into your hands when you're driving down to Wendy's. Um, this picture from 1932 is that intersection at the top of Browns Hill Road. Here's Browns Hill Road. This is Hazelwood. Beechwood is here. And Saline is here. So the school was located right around there, two rooms. It's now Browns Hill Bible Chapel. So that's where the school was, and there's that road. Um, the Bible Chapel's built on the foundation of the old school. So if you go down into the back, you can see these huge stone um, rocks and inside as well. So part of the school is still there. And there's Roosevelt School. Somebody mentioned that. Um, and we were looking for a picture of this school for years, and finally someone brought it to a class I was teaching and said, here, here is the picture of Roosevelt. So Thre Theodore Roosevelt's school was located where the Gi Greenfield Giant Eagle is now. It was built in 1906. Now, it didn't keep the Colfax name because it moved out of the 14th Ward. This is the 15th Ward, Greenfield. So by 1915, Roosevelt was so overcrowded, two portable classrooms were built, and that annex, the um, school on Saline Street, Colfax Number 2, the old one, was reopened as an annex of Roosevelt. And I think it was the fourth grade went there. Um, anyway, um, and Theodore Roosevelt, of course, was the 26th president. And there's the school. Yeah? I have a question about the orientation of the building. Is that the back looking from the Avenue? Um, you know, um, hmm. yes, how is um, the back? Yes, that's the back. That's the back. Yeah, you went there. Yes. yes, yes. Okay, that's the back. And the, the confusing thing is that the the ground was leveled for the giant eagle, but. The cars that keep landing on the roof <laughs> because of that leveling, you know, that's um, there's still that high ground behind it. Yes, sir. And um, so, um, it's apparently Roosevelt was a very well regarded school, and uh, one of the things that happened there was that the first and fifth grades were used as control groups in the first television lessons in speech, reading, and arithmetic broadcast by WQED. And I remember when I was in grade school watching that little gray television with the t lessons. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so um, I don't know how long that lasted. Didn't last too long in our school. But anyway, they, they uh, broadcast those lessons on TV for a while. That's the Roosevelt Library. And here's the giant eagle. So the ground is flattened, and back here is the higher area. In a way, Colfax Number 2 came back to Squirrel Hill because it became John Minadeo's school. Roosevelt's school was replaced by Minadeo in 1957, and it's on the corner of Saline and Lilac Street. Today it's Pittsburgh Minadeo pre-K to 5, and it has 386 students. And the person who gave me this postcard is sitting in the audience. This is her in the red dress. Nancy, do you want to just wave? Aww. So, um, All right. <laughs> that's Nancy, and that's her. She was in the first class to be transferred from Roosevelt to Minadeo. And um, wow. we get really nice things from people. Um, we, if you have any archival material, uh, photographs especially, postcards, um, eventually you'll end up on a screen sometime. <laughs> so anyway, there's Minadeo. And John Minadeo, he was a 15-year-old school crossing captain at Gladstone. Yeah. He was killed in 1954 by a runaway car at the intersection of Hazelwood and 2nd Avenues. He saw a car careening down Hazelwood Avenue. It had lost its brakes. And he heroically pushed a group of school children out of harm's way. He was killed. Um, 
There's a plaque. This plaque is in Minadeo's skull, right outside the auditorium, honoring him. So here's Colfax number three. Uh, one thing. The majority of kids at Minadeo actually came from Colfax, not Roosevelt. Say, I'm sorry. The majority of students at Don Minadeo when it opened came from Colfax, not Roosevelt. I didn't know that. Yeah, they, but they, I, I was there. They drew the lines. Okay, that's a good piece of new knowledge, thank you. Um, there, was a, there was probably, there were people who came from Roosevelt. Oh, yeah. I think it would depend on where you lived, too, and whether it was, if you were from South Squaw Hill. Well, Colfax was so crowded, it was literally in the halls. Mm -hmm. And it was just, we ended up having Colfax make the halls and the halls. Two-thirds of the people in classes in Colfax were Okay. Okay. Yeah, this was further study. <coughs> so, okay. Thank you. There. Helen? Yes? There was also another child who was killed that yes, day. Yes, there girl. was. Yeah, yeah. there and were two children killed. This year, they're hoping in the spring to actually install a memorial to her mm -hmm. at the Minadeo site. Oh, okay. Because um, there is a missing plaque down. It had. It used to be down where the accident happened, and I have some people in Hazelwood looking for it. So we're not quite sure where it is. Um, Who's the other person killed? She was a young. Just she was a girl. She was also 15, and she was the only child of an immigrant family who had only come the previous year. So it is a very sad story, but um, was she killed at the same time? He was yes. Yeah. Yeah. They, the, the car hit him, Menade John Menadeo, and the young, the girl. Yeah. But he pushed a whole lot of. I mean, you can imagine in the old days all the kids that would have been on the sidewalk, and he saved a whole lot of kids. Um, so anyway, Colfax Number Three became Forward Avenue School. And I'd love to see this picture in color because that looks so forbidding. Um, it just does not look like a pleasant place, but maybe in the sunshine with red brick, maybe. Uh, but anyway, it was built in 1886, and it wasn't built anywhere near the previous forward, the school on forward at Eldridge. It was way down um, towards uh, Lower Greenfield, and that part of Forward Avenue ended up becoming Celine Street. And you hear forward in Squirrel Hill, there's the street, there's the schools. Um, he was a very, um, uh, wow, his career, I think, Frank, you gave a talk on forward. Was that you? No, I didn't. No, some, okay, I thought it was you, but someone gave a talk on forward for us. Um, he, he, just among his many, the many things he did was he served in the United States and Pennsylvania <laughs> Congresses, was United States Secretary of Treasury. And he was a judge. His estate was on Forward Avenue near Alderdice, which is why Forward Avenue is named for him. See this retaining wall? Okay, so the school's gone. And this is a picture before that retaining wall was built. Um, but I just wanted to show you, kids didn't have such an easy time of getting to school. That's a plank sidewalk, muddy, ruddy road. Um, and the retaining wall would be right here. And it is still there. Here it is, under the parkway. So the school's gone, but the retaining wall is right there on Celine Street as you're heading down into, um, well, you know, it stops farther down because the parkway kind of cuts Celine in half, but there it is. Colfax number four was in Swiss Helm Park uh, on Whipple Street. And you might be thinking, that looks like the building that's still there, but it's not. Um, it looks like, and I don't know what they're doing with that building, whether they're reconstructing it or tearing it down, I'm not sure, but that is not it. This was farther down. It was named for Jane Gray Swisshelm, whose um, father-in-law was John Swisshelm, who owned all the land there. It was built in 1904, and it replaced a four-room frame schoolhouse that was built in 1898. Gives you an idea of where it was located. If you know, commercial is about here. This is Whipple, po Pocono, and Love Street. So here's Colfax. It says Colfax, Swiss Helm Public School. So it's in the Colfax district. Um, completely gone. Just houses. Colfax School number five was named for Thomas Whiteman, who owned the Whiteman Glass Company. 
And he also owned 30 acres of land in Squirrel Hill, and not just any, any land. Look what he owned. Here's Forbes and Murray. He owned all from Murray to Whiteman, wow. all this. So as he started to subdivide, and his heirs started to subdivide, you know, I think they reaped a lot of money for that <laughs> because, um, you know, that's prime territory. The school is up here. But he was very, very highly regarded in the community and had a real interest in education. So um, here's Whiteman School, uh, architect Ulysses J.L. Peoples. It's still there. It's not a school. It's not a public school. It's, um, it, it closed in 1980, and it's now the Whiteman School Community Building. The uh, Carriage House Children's Center owns the building. And it occupies the first floor in the basement. Second floor has nonprofit agencies and businesses, and one of those is the Squirrel Hill Urban Coalition. Uh, and the building is LEED, certi gold certified, one of only two older buildings in Pennsylvania that have that designation. Have you been in this building? Yeah. <laughs> so when you go in, you know you can breathe. You notice, I mean, we're used to Pittsburgh air, but if you go into this building, it's like your lungs aren't working as hard. So it's, I find it just incredible. So anyway, third floor, dance lessons, dancing, other activities. It's been, this ballroom um, gym has been renovated. Um, it's beautiful. Um, that's May Day in 1920, and the proscenium arch is still there. Um, beautifully ornate. The whole building has all these ornate touches to it. Um, labor omnia vincet. Uh, work conquers all. That means work hard. <laughs> so, um, but look at this scroll work. Uh, wow. Yeah. This picture shows an ice pond at Wilkins and Deniston in 1910, and the caption says, few traces of Squirrel Hill ice pond left. Now, um, this is not by Whiteman School, but this thing right here, this little sentence says, another ice pond on Solway Street, opposite the Colfax School, was recently sold to the Col Colfax School Board for $22,000. And the gist of this article is that 10 years before this, land was selling by acre, and then the developers got a hold of it, and what they charged for one lot was way more than an acre cost just 10 years before that. Development was happening so fast, and they filled the ice ponds in. If you're, in case you're wondering why Whiteman Playground is lower than road level, that's because it was a pond. So um, you can see the earthen dam was probably here. Um, assuming, because that's um, downstream. But this was a pretty dilapidated playground, and recently they, there's plans to renovate it. This building is completely gone now. And coming soon, 2019, Whiteman Park Improvement Project. It includes a wetland. <laughs> so that spring that was under there that fed the, that big pond, um, it's coming back in a sense to help prevent stormwater from rushing down into Junction Hollow. So that's the plans, and it looks really pretty. So those were the five Colfax schools, but there were a few other schools in Squirrel Hill. Um, Brown School, uh, it was open from 1882 to 1932. And believe it or not, it's still there. Not a school anymore, it's an apartment house, but if you're going across the Homestead Grace Bridge and you look up to the left, and believe it or not, that is Squirrel Hill, this little patch of houses here. Squirrel Hill sort of goes out and um, captures these houses. Um, but that was Brown's school. Uh, the Browns donated land for the public school to serve their coal miners and other workers. So. Um, this is not a picture of the, the mine that was on um, um, the bluff where the Browns, where the Homestead Grace Bridge is, but there were coal mines in those hills. Um, the coal mines in Squirrel Hill along um, um, a lot of the southern part of Squirrel Hill and Greenfield is undermined. And this looks similar because of the bluff and the tipple uh, would have come up and um, the mine would have gone into the hill pretty high. The, the coal seams are pretty high around here. 
But here's the schoolhouse, and um, along the river, there was a community as well as this. It was almost like a coal patch. Um, the Browns built the houses for their miners and their workers and sold them only or rented them only to their workers. And along here, there's a foundry, a sawmill, a machine shop. So until the rail railroad expanded its tracks, this was um, a really busy... I mean, if you walk the Dark Hollow Trail, it's, there's nothing there. But in the... Um, 1800s, 1903, early 1900s, um, there was a lot of activity down there. Uh, once the mines closed, um, the school lost population. But in the mid-1800s, a little, just a little bit about the Browns. William Brown owned a lot, a lot of coal mines, coke ovens, steamboats to carry the coal all the way down to New Orleans, and land. And his sons became even wealthier. They acquired banks, trolley companies, and other businesses. This bridge, Brown's Bridge, was built by Sam Brown, William's son, to have his trolley company go down Old Browns Hill Road, could you imagine, in a trolley, and across to Homestead. And of course, the tolls paid for the upkeep of the bridge. But anyway, this is the steamboat operation, so the workers that did the, the, where the miners and the steamboat um, workers would go to that school. So, um, I'm changing subjects very quickly here. Um, 1918, something happened in Pittsburgh that was really bad, which was the 1918 um, influenza pandemic, a worldwide epidemic of the flu. And um, Pittsburgh was hit especially hard because of the um, population density and the pollution. So um, you have magazine articles like, on my lawn sat a little bird, his name was Enza. I opened my window and in flew Enza. <laughs> so um, thanks to Wayne who found this wonderful article, um, Children Best in Schools. It was an article about the influenza and how it affected the schools. It was a major find. Um, Board of Education discussed whether to close the schools because of grip, but they decided against it. They thought students would be better off in the schools, the best possible place for students to be. The problem was getting there. If your parents were sick, or if you were sick, or if your brothers and sisters were sick, who would take care of you and try to get you to school? Um, 1918, there were automobiles, um, there were roads, there were trolleys, but um, you didn't get school bus. You walked probably a lot of neighborhood schools at the time. So um, this was a difficult time. But the main thing about this article that makes it so wonderful for research of, of Pittsburgh public schools, it, it lists all 132 Pittsburgh public schools open at the time. And this is the article and the lists, um, there's the lists. What I did was I extrapolated only the ones that were from Squirrel Hill or um, the um, area around it. And I'm not going to read all of those statistics, but you can see that um, it goes everywhere from 73% uh, absentee rate at Whiteman all the way down to 11% in the Squirrel Hill School. I didn't even mention that one. There was a school called the Squirrel Hill School. It only had 18 students. There it is. So um, it was located on Bigelow Street near Hazelwood Avenue, built in 1882. Now one, another source says it closed in 1915, but as you, you can see that article did have, um, it was still open and there were still students. There, um, 11, all but 11% were in school that day. So um, this was, as you're going down Hazelwood Avenue and Bigelow starts going up the hill, it was right in that little elbow there between the two roads. And um, it was in um, Green, well, it's in Hazelwood, so that's the 23rd Ward, the 15th, the 15th Ward today. But Squirrel Hill back then was a hill. Everything was Squirrel Hill. So next month, and I forgot to tell you this at the beginning, um, Mina Levinson is going to talk about Aldergeist. But she's going to approach it differently from me. She's not going to be showing slides. Um, she's going to be talking more about the stories and the reminiscing. 
So um, that should be a fun time um, to teach us there or taught there. And, um, but I thought since she's not going to be showing slides, I'd show you just a little bit about Alderdice. There he is. I always thought it was two guys, Taylor and Alderdice. But Taylor Alderdice was president of the National Tube Company and president of Pittsburgh's first school board. That's the whole big school board, the central one. The high school opened in 1927. So if you were wondering why Alderdice wasn't showing up on that map of the influenza cases, um, it's because it wasn't open. Um, I had someone ask me a question, well, where did the students go to high school in, from Squirrel Hill before Alderdice? And the answer is, a lot of people say Fifth Avenue, but um, Shenley, yeah, Shenley and some Peabody, yeah. Mostly Shenley from what I was told, but I can't prove that. Um, um, a few went to the business school on um, the Connolly, where Connolly is now, but uh, most of the people went to Shenley. Um, so, Squirrel Hill News. If you go to our website, all the Squirrel Hill News newspapers are on it. And I t uh, some of the stuff you pull off of there, I mean, kidnappings and um, bakery strikes and stuff like that. But anyway, there's a lot about Squirrel Hill. I'm, I'm sorry, there's a lot about Alderdice. Um, um, here is something that you might remember where if your birthday was in a certain time of year, you went to school from January to December, is it? A's and B's, yeah. Uh, so some went September to June and the others started in January. Um, so, um, and again also because of overcrowding, because for a while Alderdice had the 7th and 8th graders in it as well. But I superimposed this picture, this postcard of Alderdice, and my son said, it's got a red roof. And I thought, okay, so, oh wait, what the green roof? Yeah, there's the green roof. Okay, he said, that roof is green. And then on this picture, it's red. And on this picture, it's, this part's red, but this rest of it is a grayish color. So it was just interesting that the roof is changing colors. Um, you know, who knew? You know, these little details. Um, pardon me? Um, this newspaper? Uh, 1936. Yeah. So, um, so what do Taylor Alderdice High School, Beth Shalom and Jean Kelly have in common? <laughs> yes. Uh, he was hired by Beth Shalom as its dancing instructor in 1932, and he staged its annual Kermis at Alderdice every April from then until 1938. And supposedly this was a major theatrical production. Um, talked to somebody who was in one, and um, the staging was like Broadway quality. So anyway, this is before, this is, this picture's later, it's after he left, but you get the idea. But, you know? he <coughs> but um, you know, he also had three dance studios in Squirrel Hill, so um, are we going to have a, a talk on Gene Kelly at some point? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but I thought it was not quite Rosemary up above Rosemary and Kensington, maybe. But I don't know, it was in that area, yeah. But the dance studios were in Squirrel Hill. Um, so Davis School was another Squirrel Hill school, mm -hmm. a later one. It was built in 1931, and Davis was principal of the Henry Clay Frick Training School for Teachers. This school closed in 1980, and somebody told me orally that it just went from one, grades one to three. K through three. Yeah, and I couldn't find that in writing, but um, thank you, because um, I, I, you know, they were describing the marble inside and everything, so, um, but anyway, there's Davis. It's now Heritage Place, so it's completely gone. There's Heritage Place, a skilled nursing and rehab center. So it's on Phillips Avenue. Um, my final slide is a note about art since I was an art teacher, 1869, that's like a year after the annexation, first schools. Drawing was introduced this year. It proves to be a means of making school pleasant. 
And being naturally suited to the minds of children, it thus aids in sustaining a better attendance and improving the discipline of the schools. That's the report of a Colfax principal. So even back then, they re realized the value of art and education. So that's the end of this little journey into the history of Squirrel Hill Schools. Um, that's our website. Um, that's, uh, like I said, this talk will be on it, and other talks, and um, the Squirrel Hill News newspapers, and other information. And I'm going to leave you with one last thing. Anybody heard of Dawn's List? It's a scary website because it has a lot of information about people on it, but it has yearbooks. It has the Alderdice yearbooks on it. So if you're interested and you dare, go to Don's list. I don't know who he was or who he is and how he got all that information, but um, I did find the Alderdice yearbooks. Okay. All the yearbooks from um, I didn't look for all of them, but um, there's a number of them. And it'll, it'll just show you the yearbooks, like, like all the pages. You can oh. turn the pages. You're there. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Wow. Uh, that's scary. <laughs> so, okay, that's it. And if you have any questions or anything to add to this, <laughs> yes. Uh, Nineteen fifty-seven. What year did Roosevelt close? They closed when. Um, um, all their, uh, when Minadeo opened, so that would be in 1956, 1957. Okay. Yes? I just want to update the information. Colfax School now has uh, over about 960 kids. 900. Okay, 900. 900. 960. Okay. Uh, how many students does Colfax have now? Uh, K through 8. Yeah. Is it still a magnet of any sort? No, okay. Um, okay, any other questions? Yes. I don't know, and I also don't know when the um, when they moved the seventh, eighth, and ninth, grade, well, seventh and eighth graders out. I don't. Yeah. Yeah, they were in the annex, separated from the other kids. So. They what did they stop? Um, when they stopped having the middle graduation. Middle year graduation. In 1964. Yeah. And it was the last class. Last class. Okay, how, yeah. can I ask how you knew that? Um, I was the next to last class. Oh, okay, so it's 1964. <laughs> I don't want to embarrass you, but I'm, I'm just curious because these are things that are really hard to find. I, I could find very little information about Davis. And a lot of this information came from a, a, um, a, um, a school district employee, Dr. Thomas Baker, who was writing a book about the history of the schools. He called it Ghost Schools of Pittsburgh. So it had a lot of the information about the older schools. Never published, though. Is Risenstein considered Squirrel Hill schools? Um, Risenstein, that's where Squirrel Hill students did go to middle school and to stare it and um, but Risenstein was the in, on the feeder pattern for Squirrel Hill. But wasn't because he didn't have anything on it? No, Risenstein was um, I guess that's considered East Liberty unless they've changed the name of the neighborhood. Um, and I see some school teachers here. Um, Rosemary and Mary Ann and um, let's see a few other people. So thank you for coming, so, Charlie. Yeah, the uh, first slide you showed, the Robert Neal house, mm -hmm. that was my sixth great grandfather's house. Oh, and um, hmm. I'm interested in uh, getting it started for uh, restoration. It hasn't been renovated since maybe 1996 or 1986, I forget what year. And it's a complicated process to work with the Parks Conservancy, who has to work with the city, and they're trying to figure out um, what it would be after it was restored, you know, what kind of activities would be held there so they can justify the restoration. But it's one of, um, besides the other log cabin in uh, Shenley Park mm -hmm. and the Fort Pitt Blockhouse, it's one of three remaining uh, historic buildings in Pittsburgh. 
So you would ask yourself, why do they need a reason to restore it? Um, and I do remember touring it when it had been restored previously. And it has a long history because it was lived in. It had a Native American attack. Um, um, then it became a rest stop for the golf course, and then a shed uh, for storage, and then they rehabbed it. And I think they did have classes there at one point. Uh, Girl Scouts, was it? Uh, something. So that is a long... Would you like to write about it? <laughs> for our that, newsletter. I think you just did. Okay. <laughs> but, just, uh, is that the original location? Yes. As far as I know. As far as we know, it yeah. It was a little different. I think there was more of an extension on... Because I've seen pictures of an older you know, building that had uh, another part added on. The one with the golf course? The one on the golf course, right. Next, yeah, they, next to the... Uh, near the maintenance shed. Near the Next to the uh, statue of the Indian... Uh, yeah, Catahacasis. Cata 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 right. um, right, that right. was supposed to be a shortcut of um, Nima Collins Trail. Um, there was a spring there, too, and then the Neal House. Um, and uh, if you've seen pictures of the Block House as well, they added to that because people were living in it, and so there was a lot of stuff added around it. Um, and I, I was going to pull out the picture you're talking about, and I just didn't get to it. But there is a picture, an older picture of people living in the house. Maybe they're your relatives. Huh. So any other questions? Yes. My question had to do with lunchroom. Which schools provided lunch? Because I was astonished when I moved to Pittsburgh. I went to the Cincinnati Public Schools, came to Pittsburgh to go to Chatham, and basically fell in love with Squirrel Hill and with Pittsburgh and stayed. And uh, as a young, young woman in Squirrel Hill, my friend's kids went to Linden and to Davis. And to my astonishment, there were no lunch rooms. They had to come home for lunch. Mm -hmm. So yes, I wondered I if anybody could lunch. shed light on when, when did schools <laughs> begin to get lunch rooms, or was, did some have lunch rooms and some didn't? Or is that something I could research? You know, I have to say that Susan has contributed some very interesting articles to our newsletter. Yes, do that, please, please, because um, um, probably in the old days, kids almost always went home for lunch. But when was the transition? Um, busing put the final, that was the end of it, but before busing. Um, in Cincinnati, you know, all the all all the elementary schools I've been in do have the large room where the students that did eat lunch. Um, but when some schools may take the gym, it's like a big multi-purpose room. Right, a multi-purpose room. Right, right. Betty, well, some of it was just practical. If you could walk to school and you could walk home for lunch and get back in time, yes. yeah. you would help. Because you had an hour for lunch. Yeah. And, and you had a mother who was parked in the kitchen. That's right. Right, that's right. too. That too. Um, there were a lot of factors. Um, every school I've been in and starting in this 1972 had a lunchroom. So in my, the school I went to, which wasn't in Pittsburgh, oh it was in Turtle Creek, um, did have a lunchroom with a cafeteria. So, um, and Steve? Older guys had a cafeteria even early on? Yeah. Okay. I think students would have come from farther away, maybe. Yeah. Is older guys still 7 through 12? No, it's, it's 9 to 12. Oh. Pardon me? Okay, the Colfax, or to the candy store across the street. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what was its name? Hewitt. Cura. Cura. Okay. Okay. What was unique about Davis was that it only was K to two. Okay, two. Okay. And then, then eventually it went to three. And I actually did my student teaching at Davis after I went there. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay, anyone else? Okay, well, thank you very much for coming and come back for part two with the uh, Alderdice. Uh,